Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about what makes a game in game theory a prisoner's dilemma. So in a previous video I talked about the classic story of the two prisoners who were involved in some crime and the police offered them a deal and that story is a very typical way of describing the prisoner's dilemma as a game. In that video I interpret the main features of the game as it relates to that story and I absolutely recommend that video as an introduction to the game if you need it. The prisoner's dilemma though is often applied to lots of different situations. So if we want to think about what makes an interaction a prisoner's dilemma, we typically start with a two by two matrix like I have here. I'm just going to be working on the left hand side matrix first. We're going to have two players, so player one and player two, and each of our players has two possible strategies. They can either act in some way that's cooperative with one another, which in my table corresponds to the top row for player one or the left hand side column for player two, or they can not cooperate with one another, which corresponds to the bottom row for player one or the right hand side column for player two. Now cooperate and non-cooperate could be many different types of behaviors, but typically cooperation uh, involves working together in some way, having each other's back, uh, while non-cooperation is a failure of this sort of activity. Now the numbers inside the cells I'm representing as payoffs, so the higher the number the better for both of our players. You don't have to do it this way, but I do think it's a more standard representation, so I'm going to do it that way here. I should also say that the game is defined under full information, so everyone in this game knows the content of the matrix. And so if we then wanted to make this matrix a prisoner's dilemma, it must be the case that mutual non-cooperation so neither of our players are cooperating with one another, that has to give a lower payoff to both of our players compared to mutual cooperation, so when they both cooperate. So for instance, if the payoffs down here were say 60 and 60, it must be the case that both of our players get a higher payoff when they both cooperate. So maybe up here it could be like 80 and 80. Now down here, if player one does not cooperate, but player two does, that's going to be really good. In fact, the best outcome for player one, but really bad, in fact, the worst outcome for player two. So let's say 100 goes to player one and 20 for player two. Now up here where player one is cooperating, but player two is not, we're going to get the opposite sort of result. So player one would get, well, 20, that's the worst outcome for them. And player two gets 100, that's the best outcome for them. And so this game that I've just written out then will be a prisoner's dilemma. We can solve for it in a minute, but first I'm just going to describe the structure of incentives here which is what makes it a prisoner's dilemma. It's how the payoffs relate to one another that matters. I'm just going to describe it in a more abstract fashion. So just thinking about the matrix on the right hand side here, if mutual non-cooperation was some variable, let's say C to both players, then mutual cooperation, if we make that variable B, then it must be the case that B is greater than C. Down here where player one doesn't cooperate, but player two does, player one would get the highest possible payoff. So A, where A is greater than B and C, but player two gets the lowest of all of the possible payoffs. So say D, which is lower than A, B and C. Up here would be the opposite. Player one gets D and player two gets A. So here on the matrix on the right hand side, it's a, just a very abstract presentation of the game. Any numbers that stand in for A, B, C and D that meet these inequalities that I've written down here will give you a very classic prisoner's dilemma. Now there is more to say here because you can have variations on this basic formula, but let's first solve this game on the left hand side and see that we do actually get those outcomes that are very characteristic of the prisoner's dilemma. So just really quickly, let's first imagine that we're player one. Well, if player two cooperates, we're on this column here. Player one could cooperate and get 80 or not cooperate and get 100. 100 is greater than 80, so player one prefers to not cooperate if player two cooperates. If player two does not cooperate, we're on this second column here. Player one could cooperate and get 20 or not cooperate and get 60. 60 is bigger than 20, so not cooperating is player one's best response to player two's not cooperating. 
Now we switch it over and we can think from player two's perspective. If we are player two and player one cooperates, we're on this row. Player two could cooperate and get 80 or not cooperate and get 100. 100 is bigger than 80, so not cooperate will be player two's best response to player one's cooperate. If player one does not cooperate, we're on this next row here. Player two could cooperate and get 20 or not cooperate and get 60. 60 is bigger than 20, so not cooperate will be player two's best response to player one not cooperating. So in the game here, we get this outcome that the Nash equilibrium here, this intersection of best responses, that's where both of our players do not cooperate. It's also a dominant strategy equilibrium because not cooperate is a dominant strategy for both of our players. But this Nash equilibrium is very much suboptimal for both of our players. Both of our players would much prefer to be up here where they're both cooperating. And you can see this just because, you know, 80 is bigger than 60. This cooperative outcome, however, is inherently unstable given the structure of our incentives. It's definitely not an equilibrium outcome. If both of our players cooperate, player one has a clear incentive to defect from cooperation and get that 100. And player two also has an incentive to defect from cooperation and get their 100. So what happens is that the game ends up collapsing into the Nash equilibrium, which is a very stable outcome in comparison to the cooperative outcome, despite the fact that it is suboptimal. Once we're at the Nash equilibrium, no one can benefit through changing their behavior given what the other player is doing. So we say that they can't benefit from any unilateral deviation. And there I've really described the features of the prisoner's dilemma in a nutshell. Any game that satisfies the more abstract structure that I described on the right hand side will also give you these same outcomes. Now, before I end the video, I should say that this abstract description that I've given is very basic. There are lots of very interesting variations on this game that you will see around. And we still call those games prisoners dilemmas. So one main one that you'll see is when we allow for repeated interactions between the players, and it could be for a finite number of times or for an infinite number of times. This is what we call the iterated prisoners dilemma. Now, iterated prisoners dilemmas are really important when we're thinking about how to solve in inverted commas, the prisoner's dilemma. And by solve, I just mean, how do we make sure that if we face a situation where we have a structure of incentives like the prisoner's dilemma, how can we get our players to the cooperative outcome and for that outcome to be a stable one? And it happens to be the case that we can, under certain circumstances, if the game is repeated, we can make sure that that happens or we can help that happen. Now, another variation that students often ask about is concerning kind of the symmetrical nature of our payoffs. So in the games that I've described, the payoffs between both of our players kind of mirror one another. So just on the left hand side game, for instance, in the cooperative outcome, both players get 80 in the non cooperative Nash equilibrium, both players get 60. The most profitable outcome for both our players is 100 and the worst outcome for both of our players is 20. But it definitely doesn't have to be this way. In an asymmetric prisoner's dilemma, the payoffs for our players don't mirror one another in this fashion. So for instance, if I changed this here for player one to 500 and this here for player one to negative 30, the payoffs are no longer symmetric. In fact, player one just has a lot more to lose than player two. But importantly, I've changed it in such a way that we're still going to get those important outcomes of a failure of cooperation, a suboptimal Nash equilibrium, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to address both of these topics more carefully in separate videos, but actually if you have a look at the literature, there's just lots of people doing lots more other things with the prisoner's dilemma. So I've seen, for instance, people add a third option. So they have a cooperative strategy, a non-cooperative strategy, or a do nothing kind of option. I've seen one with three players. All of these various variations that you will see, you know, will be described as prisoner's dilemmas. You really need that central characteristic of there being a structure of incentives where there's a failure of cooperation, which is problematic, which is mutually bad for all of our players. So that's the prisoner's dilemma. What makes a game a prisoner's dilemma? at least in the most basic form. I hope that the video helped. If it did, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one, everyone.